So welcome everyone, Gihan Pereira here, and I wanna talk about HR, talent, and finding the, um, creating the environment to find and keep the best talent. So I'm calling this the best work workplace on earth. Now I run a one day workshop about the new rules for high performance teams. And some of the material that I'm gonna cover here is taken from that workshop. And I don't wanna try and compress a whole one day workshop into a 45 minute webinar. So what I'm gonna do is we'll, we'll pick and choose little bits and pieces um, and I'll take little elements and I'm going to ask you for help as well to tell me what bits you're most interested and, and you'll see how we do that as we go through the webinar. So I've got a whole slide presentation here ready to go, but we won't go through all of it. We'll, we'll pick and choose the bits that, that are the most relevant. So one of the one of my favorite quotations is from fiction, it's from Tolkien. And uh, in the book, The Hobbit, he says that if you've got a live dragon somewhere living somewhere near you, then it's a pretty good idea to take him into account when you're doing your, when you're doing your planning uh, on any journey. So now I think this is really true for many of us in whatever business, whatever industry we're in, there are a whole bunch of live dragons out there in our future, and we have to be ready for them. We have to understand that our world is changing really fast, and it doesn't make sense, and it's uh, almost negligent to ignore some of the changes that are around the corner. So you're gonna see some of these changes, but also there are some things that you can't see, so you have to be ready for that as well. So my rules of engagement for all my presentations, uh, interactive presentations like this, uh, this is an opportunity for you to think, so you know, get rid of other distractions around your workplace, and uh, we've got 45 minutes for you to think a little bit differently about talent, people, and the workplace, and also be a bit playful. So there'll be an opportunity for you to interact and engage during this webinar, which will be good for you, but it'll also be good for the other people in the room as well. And so the more you participate, the more you'll get out of it. And of course, I want to make sure that you've got some really practical actions that you can take away and put into practice. So for people who don't know me, my name's Gihan Pereira. I'm a futurist, conference speaker, workshop presenter, author and I talk about getting fit for the future and today specifically we're going to talk about the the workplace that you need to be fit for the future. Here are some of the clients that I've worked with and the reason I've chosen these clients is not a full list but these are the people uh, some of the clients that I've worked with at a leadership level um, and the reason I'm showing this list here is because you can see they're across a, a a diverse range of different business types, um, some government, some corporate, um, some international, some national, some very local, and many of them are facing the same sort of issues and challenges when it comes to creating what they want to do as a, the best workplace on earth. And um, now in my new book, Disruption by Design, there's a chapter about this called There's an I in Team, and it's all about creating the best workplace on earth. So. As much as you'll get value from today's webinar, I also want to give you um, this chapter of the book um, as a free download if you complete the exit survey at the end of the webinar. So you've got a little bit more um, in-depth material as well, because obviously there's only so much that we can cover in a 45 minute webinar. So look out for that when you uh, when we come to the end of the webinar, it'll pop up asking you to complete the exit survey. And as a thank you for doing that, you'll get a copy of this uh, this chapter from the book. Okay, so let's do the first interactive bit. So I'm keen to know who's in the room and what your main role is. So we've got a number of polls that I'm going to run in today's webinar, but this is the first one. It's a nice, easy one. Let me launch the poll for you. If you haven't done the polls before, they're anonymous. You just pick one of the answers, uh, one of the options here. And I made it pretty broad. So the, some of them, you know, you may be in the other category, but um, I made it broad enough that uh, I think we'll get some idea of who's in the room, but also specific enough that we get, we can have a little bit of granularity as well. And this will help me understand as well um, at what level to pitch some of this material and what will be most useful. Okay, thank you. So we've got to 80%, so I wait until about 80% of people have voted, which has happened now. And so let me share the results. Let me close that and share the results. Okay. Okay, great. So you can see here that uh, we've got quite a few business owners here, as well as senior leaders. So what's that? That's about uh, two thirds of the people fall into that category, either business owner or senior leader. Um, yeah, great. And there's some other HR professionals, other people leaders as well. So this is, and this is appropriate. So the, the workshop that I run about the new rules for high performance teams are for 
team members, but we'll, I'll make sure that today's webinar, the content that we're covering today, is more aimed at a leadership level. And so, and the difference, the key difference is that as a leader, your role in creating the best workplace on earth is creating the environment that allows people to perform at their best. So, and um, we won't go through the skills that the the people themselves need to be high performers, but we'll talk about how you create the environment that creates, that that, uh, that enables those high performance team members. Okay, so let me talk about this. Uh, so let me start off with this other question here. So have you been ghosted? Okay, and ghosting is a term that's become popular in the, in the online dating scene. And the online, and the, the term ghosting is when you're communicating with somebody, so you've met somebody online, and then they suddenly disappear from your life. And uh, this has become much more common now because it's um, because people are communicating electronically. So it's like you send a text, you don't get a response. So you, you message somebody, you don't get a response. You call them, they never pick up the phone. So that's a, that's a concept of ghosting. Now, what's online dating got to do with talent management and the best workplace on earth? Well, there is a thing called workplace ghosting now. And towards the start of this year, there are a couple of interesting articles talking about the fact that there's this new workplace trend called ghosting. Uh, and the idea is a similar sort of thing. And uh, so employers uh, were complaining that their potential employees are ghosting them. So they interview a whole bunch of people, they find somebody who's really good and they love them and they Bring, they want to contact them for a second interview or to bring them back in to meet the team before they make the final decision and the candidate doesn't respond. So they just disappear. They, it's not that they say, no thanks, I find something else. They just don't bother responding. And so then uh, I, I saw about six months ago, there were all these articles in um, respected business magazines and publications talking about this trend of ghosting, workplace ghosting. Now here's the thing. If you flip it around and you put the shoe on the other foot, employers have been ghosting candidates forever. It's just now that it's turned around the other way. So it's quite common for a candidate to you know, go in for an interview and then they ne never hear from the employer again. And even if they contact them, they don't even get a, a polite, no thanks, we found somebody else or anything. It's just like, it's been, it's commonplace. It's not, not every employer does that, but it was, it was considered fairly common that uh, if you're applying for a job, don't expect the employer to necessarily contact you unless they're interested in you. And the reason I'm bringing this up now is what's happened is, why are people talking about workplace ghosting now when it's been going on? It's because the power has shifted. So there is a war for talent now, and the, the, the best, the most highly skilled for the 21st century, those sort of employees have a lot of choices now. And uh, so they will do the ghosting because now they're in the position of power. And, and I'm not saying in any way, this is a good thing or a positive thing. Uh, you might think it's rude, but you know, I wonder whether you've done the same thing to potential employees. And the reason I'm saying this is that we do have a war for talent, especially people with the right skills to be able to lead us uh, further into this 21st century. Um, and there's a lot of research around this, and this is just one that said for many HR leaders that this is gonna be their biggest challenge. It's not about artificial intelligence, it's not about regulation, it's about actually finding and then keeping that high quality talent. And I've seen this shift as well in the last 10 years or so. So when, pe when people have been talking to me about what can I do to help them as a futurist, maybe about eight to 10 years ago, everyone was talking about technology. What are the new cool things out there? People are still talking about that and they're still interested in that, but that's shifted a little bit and the conversation moved to, we know there's some new technology, what skills do we need to be able to navigate this new tech world? And then in the what's happening now is that people are uh, now saying to me, clients are saying to me as, as leaders, we know that there are people out there with those skills, how do we, attract and keep that best talent, uh, that talent. And right now, the, the conversation is starting to move towards how do we bring um, and integrate artificial intelligence into our workplace as well. Um, and then what, who knows what's gonna be in, uh, around the corner after that. But at the moment uh, and today, let's talk about talent. So creating the best workplace on earth is about creating an environment where you, where you attract and keep the best talents. I'm going to give you some ideas today on how to do that. 
and in fact, I've been tracking this with my, with the books that I've written and the three most recent books that I've written. Um, so about eight years ago, I wrote Fast, Flat and Free, which is for business owners about, on how the, how the internet has changed your business. Now, I don't recommend you go out and buy that book now because it was very relevant at the time, not so relevant now. Um, but then a few years after that, I re we, we shifted from the technology side of it to, as I said, how do you lead? people with those skills. And now my latest book, Disruption by Design, which you'll get a free chapter from um, at the end of this webinar, um, is all about leading the change in a fast changing world. So uh, let's do a little bit of interaction here. So the, the World Economic Forum, identified uh, in their Future of Jobs report. Uh, so this was published last year and it was looking at a five year span. What are the most important skills for that, that workplaces will need for the future. So I'm going to share with you here what the, to uh, what the World Economic Forum identified as the top five skills that are required for Australian workplaces. But before I share that, uh, let me ask you, what do you think some of the skills for the future might be? So um, if you've got the question box on the right hand side of your GoToWebinar control panel, just type in what you think a skill for the future might be. And you may say something like, you know, problem solving. So, and you can write as many as you like, and I'll just read them out as, as people type them in. And then I'll share with you what the World Economic Forum uh, identified. Uh, trades, hands-on, is still important. Uh, working with others. Innovation, analysis. I think Nancy maybe mean, and uh, I'm assuming you mean like analytical thinking. Adaptability. Linda says, ability to adapt to change, Inga, critical thinking from Kim, design from Mark, communication from Michael, marketing and sales from Jonathan, creativity from Anne, agility from Nancy. Okay, good. Analytical skills from Mark. Okay, so let me share them with you. Um, so these are the top five and um, I think Many of them that have that I've read out, and I see some still coming in data insights from Kim, um, are also on the list. They may not just be in the top five, but that doesn't mean that they're not as uh, not important. So here are the five that the World Economic Forum identified, um, and we did see creativity. We saw um, analytical thinking came up, um, emotional intelligence. So somebody said working with others, and that's all about emotional intelligence, and um, and the skill of learning. So active learning. I ran this workshop for one group, and uh, somebody said. Act, like active like learning is not a skill it's an orientation and actually now it, it has become a skill so you have to have the skill to be able to learn to relearn to unlearn and it's got to be something that you do actively rather than just assume, just hope that the, the new new learning is going to happen okay so that's what the world economic forum identified as these are the skills that we need um, in our teams and obviously for ourselves as well to be fit for the future so how do we create that the best workplace on earth, which attracts the people with those skills? Let me explain the big change that's happened and why many organizations and businesses get disrupted and why they struggle to be able to attract the people with these skills. So this is, this is big, the big picture around this. What typically happens with most businesses, most organizations is that they go through three growth phases. Um, and they're called strive, survive, and thrive. So first of all, let's say a business starts up and they look out into the world and they see there are these customers with these problems. So they've got these black square problems. And so what they do is they build a business that's really well equipped to solve those problems. And they hire, uh, or they, they recruit people with those skills, or they recruit people and they train them with those skills to be able to solve those problems. Happy days. The business grows fast, uh, everyone works really hard, they're striving and, and they get success, they grow. But then what happens in the second phase is that not that the people lose those skills or, you, or, the, people, or, or the, the most talented people go somewhere else, that sometimes happens, but really what's happened is that the world's changed uh, on the outside. And so you still have some people with these square problems, but now you've got some people with the round problems as well. So as long as you've got customers with those square problems, you're fine if you haven't changed because you can still solve those problems. But there are 
also these other customers and it's now like square peg in a round hole you don't have the skills anymore and your team doesn't have the skills to be able to solve those problems because they're different customers different problems and there are different solutions out there but if you haven't changed and you don't have people with those skills then you can't solve those problems anymore and this is where many businesses are struggling to survive because they just haven't made the change the businesses that thrive recognize that the world has changed and now you've got new customers with different problem with new problems and so they are now building a business just like you did right at the start but they're now got the skills that are aligned with solving the problems for those customers this is why so many startups are disrupting established organizations because the established organizations are still have that old mindset that what they're doing is they have got really skilled people but they're now solving problems that there are no customers out there anymore with those problems and the startups come in and they look around they don't have the resources the assets of people but they look around and say what problems need to be solved in the world and how do we solve them this graph here um, just demonstrates why disruption happens and why so many businesses so many um, industries are being disrupted and the the disruption happens because and it's happening in a way that didn't happen in the past in the past it was great to have those skills and to build these assets and resources because the world wasn't changing so fast around us but now that the world is changing uh, we need to change and adapt and we either are going to be innovative and thrive or we're going to be the disrupted in my book disruption by design um, i say that these are both about change so it's disruption when it happens to you it's innovation when you do it yourself so our goal here is to innovate and there are three things you need to do so one is have the skill of foresight which is looking into the future the second is of course you need the people the talent to be ready for that um, for that future and then you need to be able to take action in a fast changing world and of course today we're talking about this second area we're talking about talent okay so let's have a look at what it takes to build the best workplace on earth and uh, as I said at the start I'm going to tailor this webinar depending on what you want. Okay, so I'm going to give you a little model here about I want to know what your workplace is like and I'm going to give you six, well, five categories that your workplace falls into and then we'll run a poll and we'll find out um, in the room what your workplace is like and based on which of those categories um, comes up as the highest, we, um, I'll tailor the content that, that we've got in our remaining half hour and um, based around that. So what's your workplace like or what's your workplace culture like? And this is about how your workplace um, and people generally uh, manage change or react to change. And you'll see what I mean when I, when I list these for you. So I'm going to talk about six of them and we'll do the poll based on five. Um, so the, the worst kind of workplace is the one that's complacent, that people don't think that change is happening. They look at the, they they think, oh, we can just keep doing business as usual. Nothing has changed. So we'll just we'll just keep doing what we did uh, what we've always done and we won't have we won't have a problem I'll continue to have a job for life and uh, I'll be happy my family will be happy and everything will go on as normal um so not many workplaces are like that uh, well certainly the people who turn up to either my book me for the workshop or even turn up to this webinar I'm, I'm guessing that your workplace is not complacent that people don't know that change is happening because I reckon if they did um if they were complacent, you probably wouldn't be here on this webinar. So it probably one of the other five. So the second kind is resistant to change. So these are the people who actually will take some action because they know change is happening, but the action they take is to try and restore the status quo. So they don't they don't like the change, so they push back against it. Um, and they will actually take action. So they will be active, but the action is to try and turn the clock back. So if you've got a resistant workplace, it might be okay in the short term for those people, but it's not in any way a long-term strategy and you can't keep pushing back forever because the change is much bigger than what um, you can do individually or as a team. The next one is a compliant workplace. So they are the people who say, we know there's change out there. We know that we need to do something, but you tell us what to do and we'll do it. So they're not proactive about it. All, all they'll do is what they're told to do. So those three are not so good. The more positive ones 
uh, the next three. So the next one is the, the engaged workforce uh, and where you've got a workplace where people know change is happening and they're willing to do something about it. So they're kind of engaged and um, they're not super, super engaged, they're not inspired, but they're engaged and they're willing to do something about it to make a difference. And then you get the motivated workplace. And these are the people who do come to work motivated because they know that um, their work gives a meaning and uh, they are engaged and they're willing to be proactive and take action. Uh, and the, the best and motivated and inspired uh, the, the two best kind of workplace cultures. Inspired people are the ones, and this is a minority of businesses and workplaces who love what they do. They come to work because they see work as a vehicle for um, creating the change that they want to see in the world, and they're truly inspired. And uh, this is what m many workplaces aspire to, but they don't have it yet. Okay, and now I think if you're engaged, motivated, or inspired, you're on the you're on the positive side of that that charge. And I've and we use this battery metaphor for obvious reasons that people come to work with energy based on you know where they are in this in this scale. So let's do a poll, and this will help direct where we're going in the rest of this webinar. What's your what's your workplace like? So let me run this second poll for you here. And you'll see here I've ignored the complacent one because I don't think that's relevant to the people here, uh, uh, people in the room here. But for the others, okay, what, uh, where do you think your workplace is of those five? And again, I know it's a little bit self-selecting in this room, and so I'm expecting, well, I won't say what I'm expecting, we'll see what happens. Okay, in fact, I've got a comment here. I won't, I'll keep this anonymous. We are, mo we are motivated, but being busy, we end up falling back into old habits. Absolutely, yeah, that's absolutely right. Okay, great. So we've got most people have voted. So let me close and share the results. Actually, this is interesting. So, um, and yeah, you know, this is a, because it's anonymous, people are fairly honest about it. It's really nice to see that spread. So often I see in groups like this, people at the higher end of the scale. And partly it's because there may be a little bit too optimistic about their workplace or looking at it through rose-colored glasses, but also it's partly because they are um, just self-selecting the people in the room. But it's really interesting to see that there is quite a spread here, um, which is interesting. So that's good. So it doesn't give me a huge amount of guidance about which things in, uh, in particular we should look at. I guess we should look at motivated, uh, so meaning and um, yeah, compliant. Okay, okay, interesting. Great. Okay, so thank you for sharing that. Uh, it is a little bit different from the the mix that I that I have had in the past. So it's nice to see. Yep, yeah, and I've seen I'm seeing some comments here that uh, I think in response to the previous comments saying that um, someone agrees and time is the challenge, uh, and somebody else says it's a mix of workplace types, and that's that's true as well. So especially in large organizations, you get different pockets who have a different um, different take on it and a different culture within different teams in the organization. So specifically, if you're looking to get specific action points from today, from today I reckon you should look at the the area of, over which you have some control and authority. So I know there are a lot of people here who are senior leaders. Uh, so you may say that you've got authority over the whole organization or business owners, which is, again, that's true. Um, but if you don't, then forget about the whole organization and just look at the workplace where that, that you can manage and there where you have some control over the uh, over the environment. I um, see so some really interesting um, comments here as well. So somebody else says um, between compliant and engaged, it swings. Yeah, so uh, if I can go back to this, um, this picture here. Let me show you that picture here. So yeah, so it's like, like kind of jumping, over, like crossing back and forth over that line. So people sometimes are engaged, but then, uh, if, especially if they find that management and leadership aren't willing to support them, then they go back to go, okay, I've tried. <clears throat> It's not working, so just tell me what to do. So they go back to compliant, okay? And the same is the other way around. If, you're, if you've got a compliant workplace and you give them, if let's, let's do this here, if you give them a little bit of authority so that they can then take a little bit more control, then they can become more engaged because now they feel that there's a little bit more control in their life. Um, so the three things, if you want to move uh, between these, uh, into these top three stages, um, 
compliant to engage is about build, uh, giving people authority. Um, engage to motivate it is making sure that the workplace has some meaning so that they, the work that they do is meaningful and uh, not just menial and not just for money. And, uh, and it's uh, ideally a place where they, they can proudly say, I work for this organization or work for this company uh, for whatever reason. And they're proud to say it outside work as well. And if you want to go from motivated to inspired, what you want to do is build judgment in your people. So help them exercise good judgment. So we'll see, we might have time to go into that a little bit, um, or we might not, we'll, we'll see how we go with that. Um, yeah, maybe we will, because uh, there were very few people who rated their workplaces inspired. So we'll see how time goes, but we'll, we might even get to a little bit around that. Uh, so the three things we want are building authority, um, giving people authority, uh, giving people meaning in their workplace and helping build good judgment. Um, okay, great to see comments coming in as well. So I'm keeping half an eye open on that as well. Uh, so yeah, so Mark says an inspirational leader makes all the difference because it depends on leadership and leading by example. Fantastic. Okay, so uh, I've got some, as I said, this is only a 45 minute webinar and there's only so much that we can do. So I've got some additional resources for you as well. One is if you go to uh, this web address, kihanparera.tv, which is the video page on my website, there are, there are a bunch of videos around talent, HR, and these are all free um, and you can watch them. One of them is this, 10 ways to be a talent magnet based on the latest research on what employees are looking for from their workplace. So I'll, I'll mention a couple of these videos as we go through, but they're, they're all there on that on that resource page, gihanperera.tv. And the second thing is, if you want to do this, again, it's a free self-assessment, on my website, if you go to bestworkplaceonearth.com, and you can do this self-assessment, which takes you through those broadly, those the, the five things that make up the best workplace on earth. You, you do the assessment, and then it'll email you a report on the on how you did and the things that you can do to, to improve your workplace. So that's available to you as well as an additional resource. Okay, let me jump to, let's look at one of these things, and, and we'll look at Okay, I'll keep it a surprise. Okay, let's look at... Uh... Okay, so I've got a few other polls for you. And these polls are a little bit different. So this poll is a little bit like a quiz rather than a poll. So there's some research done by Cone Communications about Gen Y. So Generation Y are the millennials. So they're the people who are now um, well established in many leadership and management positions. So they're, they're, they're like 40 or younger. So this we're not talking about the 20 year olds anymore. Uh, this, that's Generation Z. And that's an important part of our workforce, but let's look at Generation Y. So they've, they've got strong leadership uh, roles. They exercise a lot of influence in organizations. And so Cone Communications did this research and they asked this question um, you know, about Generation Y. Uh, so Two thirds of them won't take a job if a company doesn't have what? Okay, so let me ask this as a quiz question for you. I guess it's a little bit different than the other polls because this is me actually asking you, what do you think? What do you think that Gen Y said that they must, must have? Okay, most people have. Uh, what is CSR? That's um, corporate social responsibility. So they have some sort of purpose apart from just making a profit. Okay, so they have some sort of, um, yeah, like, like a social cause that they support, or maybe their business itself is a social cause. Okay, so let me see the results. And yes, that's correct. Uh, most people got the right answer, which is a strong CSR values. Okay, so um, the cone, cone communication research said that, that uh, most Gen Y won't take a job unless a company has strong CSR values. And it's more than just token now. So 10 or 15 years ago, if you said, we've got a CSR program and it might be that 3% you know, of revenue or 1% of revenue goes into a social cause and we get our employees to decide what the cause is. And, that used to be good enough and it's not anymore. So now CSR or your purpose has to be baked into 
um, the work that people do. So this is coming back to the idea of meaning. So if you want a motivated workforce, give them work that's meaningful to them. There's a lot of talk about employee engagement and how, how you create engagement. Well, the best way to do that is to give people work that has meaning. So this is a difference between offering a salary job and taking people on a shared journey. So if you're just offering a sal salary job, that's not bad. If you're helping solve customer problems or help customers achieve their goals, that's really good. It's really good. But now for the best workplace on earth, that's just a price of entry now. What you want are people who share mission, values, and purpose. Now, this is quite a, when you think about, uh, when I run this in, a, in my workshop, it actually takes a, it's a long, it's a long process. Uh, and it's you know, we talk quite uh, in depth about this, but let me give you one idea that you can take away and put into practice here. If you think about in your leadership, in your leadership practice, on a day-to-day -day basis for your team, what level are you playing at? And this is not every day, but if you're saying that we're looking at the, the whole spectrum from A to Z, if you're thinking about change are we only thinking about bit by bit change? So making small changes in the workplace, that's really good. Um, making small improvements, innovating at a bit by bit level, that's great. And good managers do that and they enable and facilitate that. Doesn't necessarily make you a leader. If you are then, the, the next level, which is what really good leaders do, is they do goal-based innovation or project-based innovation or change. So we say every 90 days, we've got a goal, we're going to achieve that goal and that motivates people and that's really good so that's better than um just bit by bit management uh, but by the way i'm not saying any of them are bad i'm just saying that if you like leaders set goals run projects and they help create the environment where people can perform at their best to achieve those goals the really best leaders the transformational leaders are the ones who are taking their team or their organization on a quest so they're doing what Steve Jobs said, like what, what's the dent you're gonna make in the universe? And that's what you really do if you want motivated and inspired team members. So uh, we can talk about all these three levels, but let's jump right to the big one. So what's your big idea? So this is a rhetorical question. I'm not asking you to, uh, to share it in the question box, but what change are you making as a result of you running your business. There's a lot of business owners here, a lot of senior leaders here, and it's not just about um, looking after yourself and your family. It's not just about meeting shareholders' uh, returns. It's what's a, what's a change that you're making? What's your big idea? And uh, the CEO of Box, so Box is like Dropbox, Sam Skilachi, um, he said, here's one test around this. If 80% of the people you talk to say that it's the stupidest idea that they've ever heard, and 20% think it's the best thing since sliced bread, then that's the sort of thing that, that's going to motivate and inspire the right sort of people. It's not for everybody. In fact, it's not for the majority of people, but for the people for whom it's right, they will be the most motivated, inspired, and loyal uh, team members. Okay, so what's your big idea? And I'm not gonna ask you to, to share it here, and this is a question that you should be asking your team as well. How are you gonna bring them along on that journey. Okay, let me just see uh, questions. Okay, somebody else asked about CSR again. So this is this whole idea of a, a, social, a social cause. So CSR is a corporate social responsibility. And um, that's what it stands for, but it's saying, does, does your business have a purpose? And that's a simpler way of, and the more engaging way of describing it. So what's the purpose of your business beyond just making a profit and returns to shareholders? or to, to management and ownership. Um, any quest, quick questions about that? This whole idea of uh, building a business, an organization or team that has, uh, that where the work's meaningful, it's a big question. And uh, I only want to give you one little idea around that today. But um, yeah, and it's, it's a, it, for some people, it's a lifelong quest. Uh, for others, it's like, you don't need to, you don't need to have it today for your business to, to succeed, but there are, um, there's value in engaging your team in figuring out how do we make our work meaningful and what's our business actually going to do and how is it going to change the world. So it's a big question and uh, many businesses don't have that, but in the best workplace on earth, if you want to attract the best talent, um, that's what you need. Okay, so let me move on to another one then. Okay, we'll look at this area around 
a little bit around authority. Okay, here's what I'll do. Um, Okay, so I'm going to jump ahead a little bit or um, jump around in the in the presentation. So just give me a sec to get to this point. Um, okay, let's start this with another little quiz question. So you can see it here. Um, so this is some research done last year uh, by ORC International talking about mentoring. So let me ask the quiz question. How many women are happy with the mentoring that's being provided the organizations okay so let me launch that question and see what you say what do you think and i'll share the results i should say that every time i run this question the majority get it right so i think whatever your first whatever your first instinct is uh, go with that one because i think there's a pretty good chance you'll get that right and it's happening here as well as i see the results coming in good thank you for most people voting um if you said it's pretty low, then that's correct. So yes, everyone said it's pretty low, okay? And most people were um, rated even like really low. So the, the results showed that. So the results showed, uh, I'll share it with you here, that the number of people, the number of women happy with the mentoring that the organization provides is like one in six. So very low. By the way, um, it's not that much higher for men either. So it's one in five. Okay, so mentoring, the, and the reason I'm picking mentoring here is mentoring is something that's very easy for you to implement, regardless of your role. Mentoring just needs two people, the mentor and the mentoree. And you don't need a, a, a formal mentoring program in your organization. You don't need it to be run company-wide, organization-wide. You don't need permission to set up mentoring. You just do it. But what I want to do is challenge you to take it to the next level and find a reverse mentor. And a reverse mentor is somebody who is a you know, traditional mentoring is a more senior person mentors a more junior person. Reverse mentoring is the other way around. So one of my clients, uh, Janet, actually, she's now Janet has now retired as a CEO of a, this law firm in Brisbane. But she used to have this uh, reverse mentoring when she was CEO. So every six months, she would find somebody more junior to her who to be her mentor um, oh, so junior as in she, she would find somebody younger so younger could be one of three things it could actually be somebody younger in age so a young person like in a different generate from a different generation could be younger in the practice so regardless of age they may be new in the practice so they'd have different insights from outside um, or it could be somebody new in law so a recent graduate because they would bring in whatever is being taught at universities about and law schools about the law. And she would just have these informal conversations. As you can see here, she says, always interesting. And she was the learner rather than the teacher. Now, of course, in any mentoring arrangement, um, both parties um, benefit from it. But the whole idea is that what you're doing is you're flipping the tables. You're turning the tables on this idea that the more senior person who has experience, judgment, and can teach, can build wisdom, uh, has wisdom that they can teach, that's all good and that's still relevant. But reverse mentoring says that there are junior people who have different experiences, different expertise, and most, most importantly, a different perspective on the world that they can bring in to and that they add value as well and this is a real trap that many leaders fall into is they think that their experience that got them to where they are now is the same experience that's going to carry their them and their team to success in the future and it's not the case remember that that uh, diagram that i showed you earlier on it's not that the leaders have got dumber or they've forgotten their experience it's just the world has changed and there's now different customers different problems different ways of solving those problems that those leaders just don't have that experience in and there are other people who do have that experience and that perspective so the experience and expertise of the more junior people uh, might be more relevant for solving those problems and their perspective will actually uh, inform leadership about what those problems are so you could imagine that so when I work with financial planners, for example, and do a lot of work in, in that area, so a lot of their perspective is around uh, how do we prepare people for retirement and for people to be healthy and wealthy in retirement. But there may be young people like the Generation Zs in particular who say, I never want to retire. Um, I don't want to wait till I'm uh, old and decrepit before I can enjoy my life. I want to be able to live life well 
for, for a long time. And I can, I'm happy to keep working as long as I can enjoy my life as well. So that perspective may be something that the industry hasn't thought about. But if you have a reverse mentor who's giving you that, that advice and that, that perspective, it could be really valuable. Okay, so um, I want to quickly check if anyone's got any questions about that, about doing reverse mentoring. It's very easy to set up. Find a reverse mentor. So the, the two steps you do, and in the workshop we do this in a lot of detail, but the, the two steps you do is one, identify what of these three things would you like, like what would you like to know about, what sort of perspectives would you like, and then identify somebody who can be your reverse mentor. It could be somebody in your team already. It could be somebody that in another team, and you could talk to a peer about setting that up. It could be somebody completely outside the business. It could be somebody from your personal life. It could be uh, if you have teenagers, uh, if you already have teenagers in your life, then you've got futurists already living with you. They could be a reverse mentor, but you need to give them permission for them to be open and honest and be willing to share some hard truths uh, because sometimes they may be a bit reluctant to do that because you're the more senior person. Uh, Felicity says it's also invigorating and I think the same thing Felicity so I've got a couple of reverse mentors in my life and it's great just listening to them and learning from them. Okay anything else any other questions or comments? Okay good so I think uh, given that uh, I'm trying to give you some really practical ideas I think uh, the, the two things that we talked about like looking at providing more meaning and giving people more authority, which is what that reverse mentoring comes comes back to, um, is really uh, some really practical things that you can take and put into place. So before we finish, I've got a couple of things for you. So first of all, a little bit of a puzzle here. And I've run this with lots of groups. Um, this is a puzzle that I first saw as a kid. So it's something that you may have seen before, and if you have, that's no problem. Um, I'm going to ask. I'm going to ask the puzzle, and I'm going to ask you to write down your answer in the question box. There's no prize for this, so this is just for bragging rights. Uh, so let me let me explain the puzzle, and then I'll ask you the uh, ask you the question. And so, ready with hands on keyboard or finger on um, finger on iPad, ready to answer. So here's a puzzle. There is a lake, or a uh, um, there's a lake uh, with a lily pad. So lilies are growing on the lake. On the first day, there is one lily in the lake. And then it's the number of lilies doubles every day. So then on the next day, there's two, the next day, there's four, the next day, there's eight, and then 16, 32, 64, and so on. And it fills that lake or that pond in 28 days. Okay, so 28 days, the pond is completely covered. So the question is, and this is where I'd like your answer, when is it half full? So on which day is it half full? Okay, so let me just see. People are going to answer. Ah, okay, so Jonathan answered straight away with the correct answer, uh, and other people are answering as well with that answer. Uh, yeah, good. Everyone's getting that. Okay, so somebody says no idea. Uh, okay, so here's the answer. So the answer is 27 days. Okay, so it fills a pond in 28 days. So let me show you. Let me show you this diagrammatically. So if you can imagine that the on day 28, it's 100% full, and given that it doubles every day, the day before that, it was half full. Okay, so now you've got this nice little fun puzzle that you can share with your family and friends, uh, family and friends, but that's not the point I wanna make. Let's look back a few days. So the day before that, day 26, it was a quarter full, so the green bit showing how much is full. Then 25, it's a 1 8th, 1 16th, 1 32nd, and so on, right? So if you look back at the start of the week, it was between one and 2% full. And that's not even counting the first three weeks. So this has gone on for four weeks. In the first three weeks, it was only 1%, only 1%. And you, if you get to the start of this fourth week, you think there's hardly any lilies in the pond. And yet, because of this exponential growth, the it actually grows rapidly and it grows so fast. And this is what a lot of people struggle to get their head around. So when they're thinking about what's coming up in the future, you might see and you go, oh, look, this is only 1%, it doesn't really matter. Like 1% of the industry is doing this or 1% of our customers are doing this or 1% of our people are unhappy. Uh, 1%, we've only got 1% of the, the, the skills that we need. And you may not realize that 
that change is happening so rapidly that uh, you're on this you're on the first part of this exponential growth and um, so lots of people talk about companies like Kodak uh, which didn't see the growth of uh, digital and they were look, still looking at film and then they became bankrupt and the big reason was um, they invented the digital camera but Kodak leadership didn't see that digital uh, digital photography was going to grow exponentially so they said yeah digital's good but it's slow it's clunky and it's only a tiny 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 part of potential market share so they missed the opportunity because they didn't realize uh, what was going to happen with with digital photography and they didn't see the potential okay so don't make that mistake so don't be the sort of person uh, who looks at the world and says, oh, it doesn't matter because only 1%, because that 1% could grow very rapidly. Okay, so just to finish off, um, as I mentioned at the start, I run this workshop called the New Rules for High Performance Teams. This is for your team members. So for people in your team, assuming that you're a leader who's created the environment where um, it enables perf uh, high performance, um, then this is how this is how performance and productivity have changed. Because some of the things that used to work don't work anymore. So setting goals works differently, managing change works differently, collaboration works differently. So these are really practical skills that your team members can can learn. So if you're interested in that, please get in touch with me. Um, I'd love to have a chat with you about that. And um, also just a reminder to complete the exit survey and I'll send you um, the chapter of the book, Disruption by Design, which is all about um, all about the things we've talked about and it'll cover some of the things that we didn't talk about as well um, but some of the other things that will help you build a high performance team and uh, apart from that there's nothing else for me to say except to say thank you thanks very much for coming along thanks for participating and helping drive the the webinar content and that helps because I, it makes it more and more relevant so thank you everyone for coming along have a great day and more important than that Hope you really take some of these ideas and put them into place to create the best workplace in it. Thanks everyone. Bye for now.